Now, I've spoken in the not too distant past on some of the minor <coughs> prophets. Um, I think it was on, on uh, the Martelsham Zoom during COVID. Well, I'd also considered uh, some of the others and made some notes on them. So, uh, after prayerful consideration, I felt I should bring another one before you. I'll tell you a bit later on which prophet I have in mind. Okay, I'll tell you straight away. I'm sure that <coughs> most of us, perhaps all of us, understand this, but it's still worth saying. The Old Testament prophets didn't write about us. They didn't write primarily for us, but they are part of God's inspired word. And uh, we should, for that reason, even if there isn't another reason, there are other reasons, but even if there weren't another reason, for that reason we should be interested in what they say. But of course, there are other reasons. You know, the whole of the scriptures is God's word and it's relevant to us. We learn about God, we learn about his character, his ways, his thoughts. We learn of Christ, we learn of the human race, we learn about ourselves. <laughs> so let's see what we can learn from our prophet this afternoon. And, you know, I hope we can stir an interest in uh, what this man has to say. And uh, perhaps look at the book more carefully later on. Now, I like to see biblical accounts in their historical context. We can, of course, learn much from each book, even without understanding where they come in history. But uh, I think if we do understand the history associated with them, we, it does help us to understand more fully what's written. So what was the situation at the moment? those that our prophet was speaking to. Mm -hmm. What had happened previously? Okay, we'll begin there. Now, we know that the kingdom of Israel split after Solomon's reign because of Solomon's disobedience to the Lord, his turning away from the Lord. Um, a little after a thousand BC, probably. <coughs> and the Lord removed most of the nation from the rule of Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And David and Solomon's descendants were left with just two of the 12 tribes of Israel, and 10 were given to a man called Jeroboam to rule over. Now, because Jeroboam felt insecure, he didn't want his people traveling to Judah, to Jerusalem, to worship God. So he made idols, so-called gods. And the golden calves, these were. He put one in the north of the country, one in the south, and he instructed the people to worship them. And that's what the vast majority of people seem to have done. They seem to have accepted what Jeroboam said. Well, the kingdom of Israel, this is this northern kingdom, survived for about 250 years altogether. They had 19 kings in all, not one of them did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Very sad. They, all of them seem to have followed the ways of Jeroboam, the king who put the golden calves down and, and, uh, and Bethel. <clears throat> okay, so going forward now about 70 years from the split, we're now with the seventh king of Israel, a chap called Ahab, the most evil of the kings so far. I'm sure we all know of the drought that God brought on the land and they had run-ins with uh, God's prophet Elijah. Well, Ahab's evil son Jehoram was overthrown on God's command by his army commander. This is Jehu. And Jehu made himself king. Now, Jehu made the right noises to start with. <clears throat> But he, like the people really, wasn't interested in following the Lord. And the Lord punished Israel. He made them suffer from enemies around. The Syrians to the north were particularly troublesome to them. 
and things deteriorated, not just spiritually, but militarily as well. And they got to a very low point during the reign of uh, Jehu's son, Jehoahaz. They suffered terrible oppression from the Syrians. And I'll just read one or two verses from 2 Kings 13. No need to turn them as you wish. But we learn about Israel under Jehoahaz. Now, this is Jehu's son. It says in 2 Kings 13, verse 3, then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he delivered them into the hand of Hazael, king of Syria, and into the hand of ben Hadad, the son of Hazael, all their days. And then skipping through to verse 7, that he left of the army of Jehoahaz only 50 horsemen, 10 chariots, and 10,000 foot soldiers, foot soldiers. For the king of Syria had destroyed them and made them like the dust at threshing. And then suddenly, out of this bleak account, we read something encouraging. Verse 4. So Jehoahaz pleaded with the Lord. And that translation says he besought the Lord. And the Lord listened to him. The Lord heard him. And the Lord graciously provided a saviour. Um, <clears throat> I presume that that is actually Jehovah has a son, Joash, also called Jehoash. Jehoash defeated the Syrians three times. And I'm sure you remember the account also in the same chapter in 2 Kings 13, where Jehoash visited Elisha when Elisha was dying. And Elisha told Jehoash to strike his arrows on the ground. And Jehoash did this three times. And Elisha was cross with it. He should have done it five or six times. And then he had destroyed the Syrians. But he did defeat them three times. The Lord in wonderful grace saved Israel from their enemies and then allowed them economic prosperity and military might during Jehoash's sons, Jeroboam, this is Jeroboam II, during his reign. So we have a succession of four, I think, interesting kings here. We have Jehu, instructed by God to destroy Ahab's dynasty. He did so, but he didn't follow the Lord. Secondly, we have Jehoahaz, brought low by the Syrians, but he besought the Lord, and the Lord heard him. Thirdly, Joash, or Jehoash, he won three victories over the Syrians, but showed a lack of faith that limited his success. And then fourthly, we have Jeroboam II, military, militarily, and economically, very successful. But sadly, none of these did what was right in the Lord's eyes. Now, we could say a lot more on this history, but uh, I don't want to bore you on this. There are, for example, very interesting links with Jonah and the Assyrians, but uh, we need to, need to go to our prophet. So let's see if we can work out who our prophet is. We're in the days of Jeroboam II, okay? These are days of prosperity, days of success for Israel. This is probably somewhere between 150 and 200 years after the death of Solomon. And what we will see, what comes across so clearly as we uh, look at our prophet, as we consider what he writes is that God had chastened the Israelites, but now he was graciously giving them another chance. But tragically, rather than repenting, the rulers lived in luxury, they remained idolaters, they ignored God's law, therefore judgment had to come. As is so often the case, I think, with earthly prosperity comes 
self-satisfaction and forgetfulness of God. <coughs> With suffering there comes at least sometimes repentance and returning to God. Now I'm just going to read a few verses from our prophet. I'll tell you who he is in a minute. So that we can get a feel for what things were like the ruling classes in Israel at that time. Okay? So this is what he writes about the ruling classes. Who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments, and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointment, but are not grieved. The affliction of Joseph. Well, our prophet did some of his preaching, perhaps most of it, at Bethel, the religious center with the golden calf that Jeroboam had set up. Bethel means house of God. It was then house for an idol. Who was our prophet? Well, I expect some of you have guessed, but if you don't know yet, here's some more clues. He came from Judah rather than Israel. Okay, he came from a little town called Tekoa, which was 10 miles south of Jerusalem, five miles south of Bethlehem. He was a farmer, he looked after sheep, and he looked after sycamore fig trees. So, yes, he was a chaos. Okay, now the prophecy of Amos easily splits into three sections. Okay. In the first two chapters, we see what God thinks of the sins of the nations around Israel, followed by his views of the sins of Judah and Israel themselves. That's the first section, first two chapters. In the second section, that's chapters three to six. We see various reasons the people of Israel may chance to put forward as to why they shouldn't fear God's punishment, why they shouldn't fear God's judgment, and why these reasons or excuses, why they don't work. In the third section, that's chapter seven to nine. Amos has five visions of judgment, and he comments on them. And the book ends on a positive note. There's restoration for the land. And of course, there's a lot of detail, important detail, that we can't discuss in a limited talk like this. But hopefully, we'll take away at least some understanding of some of the main points. Okay, so three sections, yeah? Chapters one and two. A brief description of the sins of the nations around Israel and Israel itself. Second in chapters three to six, Israel's excuses on why they fail. And thirdly, chapter seven to nine, we have five visions. Okay, so first one, chapter one, verse one. <clears throat> the words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So he began preaching two years before the earthquake. And that earthquake should have impressed upon people the warning that Amos was giving them. The earthquake was a major event. Now we know that because it was still in the collective memory of the people some 250 years later. Zechariah reminds them of it. In Zechariah 14, verse 5, he says, You shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Isaiah, king of Judah. 
So 250 years later, it was still in the nation's memory. It was a big event. And I think it was a warning to the people that they had to deal with a mighty and a powerful God. Yeah. Well, throughout the book, we can see God's condemnation of the kingdom of Israel, but he begins in the first two chapters by showing that he's fair, he's a just God. He notes and condemns the sins of the neighboring nations. The people of Israel, having heard God's condemnation of them, wouldn't then be able to say, why does God pick on us? What about all the rest? And then, of course, Israel and Judah had a much greater responsibility than the other nations. God had chosen them, but he'd given them his law. They were in a much more serious and responsible position before God than these other nations that are mentioned in Israel. With privilege, there comes responsibility. And the privileges that they had put them under great responsibility. Of course, the same is true for us to an even greater extent. We've all heard about the suffering and death of the Lord Jesus, how he died for each of us. And those having heard and rejected put themselves under terrible judgment. We have great responsibility once we've heard. So back to Amos. So in the first two chapters, we have God's assessment of the six nations around Israel, and then the kingdom of Judah, and, uh, followed by the kingdom of Israel itself. So for each of these eight nations, there were reasons for God's condemnation. And Amos uses an unusual structure here for each of them. He writes, starting with verse three, if we look at that, for three transgressions of wherever, in verse three it's Damascus, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. For three transgressions and for four. So in verse three, we have Damascus, that's Syria, Verse 6, Gaza, the Philistines. Verse 9, Tyre. 11, Edom. 13, Ammon. Verse 1 of chapter 2, Moab. But he doesn't list three or four sins. Usually, he only mentions one. But I think the structure means this, something like this. Someone could be condemned on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So two was considered to be adequate testimony. Three was ample, abundant testimony. So four, well, four, well, four must be super abundant testimony. The sins of these nations were so great that although the Holy Spirit in these chapters generally or sometimes anyway, only quotes one sin, he has so much more testimony against each that he could use against them. I think we could say he has super abundant testimony of the evil and that they deserve punishment. Chapter two and verse four, we have Judah condemned. Judah is condemned for despising God's law, yeah, the middle of verse 4, they have despised the law of the Lord. Whereas, if we look a few verses further down, where Israel is condemned, God's law seems really to have passed out of their conscious knowledge. They're condemned for actions which even their consciences should have told them were wrong, let alone what the details of the law said. Okay, moving on. Moving on to chapter three. This begins the second section of the book. What I've called Israel's reasons for not fearing God's judgment. 
from why that wrong. This one, chapter 3, verse 1. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together unless they're agreed? Now, as I noted, most of what Amos writes is directed at the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. But there are some references to Judah. And here at the beginning of chapter 3, he's referring to all the people, both Israel and Judah. And the principles outlined in the next few verses apply to the whole nation, to both kingdoms. So the condemnations of Judah and Israel that we saw in chapter 2 show that there's no harmony between the people and God. Beginning here in chapter 3, the Lord points out that he only has known them and that this lack of agreement, this lack of harmony, is because of their iniquities. We see that in verse 2, and can only lead to judgment. The people can't argue that they should be judged by God because they're going on together with God. That just isn't true. There's no harmony between themselves and God. Okay, moving on to verse 7 of chapter 3. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? God graciously gave them prophets to remind them of what God expected of them and to tell them what will happen. These prophets provided warnings and told the people of God's coming judgment. And then the rest of chapter 3 describes God's judgment on Israel. He describes what will happen to the nation. They can't say they haven't been warned. Many prophets were sent by God. Not just Amos. Many prophets were sent by God to warn them. They can't say they haven't been warned. Chapter 4, verse 1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the, crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring wine, let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, the whole day shall come upon you when he will take you away with fish hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. You will go out through the broken walls, each one straight ahead of her, and you'll be cast into harm, says the Lord. Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Proclaim and announce the free will offerings for this you love, you children of Israel, says the Lord God. So Amos notes here in these verses that the selfish women of Israel's ruling class were living in luxury, but they will be led out as captives. Their false religious rituals as described here in verses four, 4 and 5, they won't help them. The main message of chapter 4 is that God had already disciplined them. I've warned you and warned you and warned you and warned you and warned you, but you have taken no notice. He disciplined them in many different ways. In fact, five are mentioned here. And then after each, he says, but you have not returned to me. 
So then, how had God warned and chastened them? Uh, for time's sake, we won't actually read these verses, but we'll just pick out the points that we're making here. <clears throat> so in verse 6, we see famine and crop failure. It mentions cleanness of teeth. That's what this refers to. No food. Verses 7 and 8, we have withholding of rain. Verse 9, we have blight. Mildew and locusts. Verse 10, we have plague and death by sword. And verse 11, we have overthrow, as God did to Sodom and Gomorrah. Divine judgment, God directly intervening. So these punishments God had already made the people suffer. These punishments as described by Amos, famines, crop failure, withholding of rain, blood, mildew, locusts, plague, death by the sword, defeat in battle, overthrow, they happened. And in fact, God had already warned the Israelites that these things would happen if they rebelled against him. If we were to read Deuteronomy 28, we would see that all these punishments were specifically mentioned as to come upon the people if they didn't obey him. And sadly, after the description of each of these chastening events here in Amos, the Lord has to say to them, yet you have not returned to me. We noted the suffering that was brought on Israel by the Syrian army during the reign of Jehoahaz. But we also noted that he besought the Lord. He just needed that turning to him. And the Lord rescued them in answer. And now, some years on from this, maybe 30, 40 years on, he's graciously about them peace and prosperity. But thanking God for this and submitting to him, but paying him, that was not their agenda. So inevitably, verse 12, chapter 4, verse 12. Therefore, thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God. <coughs> He's repeatedly chastened. He was gracious to them. He gave them prosperity. But in general, none of this brought the people of Israel back to God. Prepare to meet your God and your system. Of course, we will all meet God. Are we prepared? Are you prepared? Well, chapter 5 begins with the coming judgment and the call to repentance. In verse 4, we see the Lord saying, Seek me and live. In verse 6, Seek the Lord and live. In verse 14, Seek good and not evil that you may live. So a solution was available to them. That was the way to prepare to meet their God. So prepare to meet your God is answered by seek the Lord. And there was the offer of real life, seeking the Lord. True seeking of the Lord, not, not, just, not just words, of course. A true seeking of the Lord will be shown practically by their looking to do what the Lord wanted them to do. Looking to do good, stopping to do evil. That was available to them, but as a nation, they didn't take it up. Individuals may have done so, of course, but as a nation, they didn't. So there would be judgment. The day of the Lord is mentioned in verse 18, we're on chapter 5, so in verse 18, 
Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. But what good is the day of the Lord to you? It'll be darkness and not light. Now, clearly, they've heard of the day of the Lord. And perhaps there's some remembrance of Joel's prophecy. We don't know when Joel was speaking. It was probably some years before Amos. But Joel emphasised the day of the Lord. The future time when God will directly and obviously intervene in the affairs of the world. Initially judgment. And I'm guessing that here. Yeah, but I think it's likely that some of the false prophets that existed around this time, in Joel's day, uh, sorry, in Amos's day, had taken what Joel said about the day of the Lord and distorted it. The day of the Lord will include judgment on God's and Israel's enemies, and there will be restoration of Israel and a wonderful time for Israel and the whole earth during the millennium when the Lord will reign. That was part of Joel's message, but much of what Joel said was about judgment for Israel. Now that's not what the people would want to hear. So a false prophet wanting to be popular will omit that part of it and just tell the people the part that they'd like to hear. And so such a message could easily make the people think, day of the Lord, yes, bring it on. Let's hope it comes soon. Not realising that it'll be a time of terrible judgment. Verse 21, chapter five, verse 21. I hate, I despise your feast days, and I do not savour your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments, but let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Did you offer me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, O house of Israel? You also carried Sicketh, your king, and Sheen, your idols, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will send you into captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. We see that religious ceremonies would not save them from judgment. In fact, religious ceremonies where there is no change of heart are just insulting to God. He demands a change of heart shown by a change of behaviour. And he mentions here in verse 24 justice and uh, practical righteousness. When the Israelites were in the wilderness going to the land that God promised them, with Moses leading them, God pre God's presence with them, were their sacrifices really for God, they must ask? No, they're really taking idols and foreign gods with them. Uh, these verses 25 to 27, many years later, Stephen quotes them uh, to the Jews who are about to kill him. We see that in Acts, Acts 7. He points out that they themselves had killed the just one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that they were just like their ancestors that Amos is talking about here. Mm. So back to Amos, the religious observance of the people in Amos's day wouldn't save them from God's judgment. He looks for reality, not ritual. Chapter 6, verse 1. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion and trust in Mount Samaria. So both nations mentioned there, Zion being Judah, Samaria being the capital of Israel. So we see that the ruling classes of both Judah and Israel are as evils. Local enemies are defeated. The big potential enemy, Assyria, is quiet. I think as a result of the preaching of Jonah, there was peace in the lands. 
Life is good. Though at the zenith of the military and economic power. And what comes across here is great self-confidence. Not confidence in God. Not thanks to him. Not reliance on him. But confidence in themselves. But judgment, judgment awaits. Pride and self-confidence are a recipe for trouble. They won't save them from disaster. They have no grief over their sins. So I know both Israel and Judah are mentioned in that first verse. The emphasis is on the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, we see that with the mention of Joseph, uh, the ancestor of two of the tribes of the northern kingdom. We see that in verse 6. Their confidence wasn't in the Lord. It was in themselves. Roman power and prosperity, but it wouldn't last. It wasn't long before there was a rapid decline in the kingdom. <coughs> so, to conclude this second section of Amos's prophecy, that's chapters three to six, I'll just quickly run through what I see as some of the reasons that the Israelites might have put forward to say that they shouldn't be judged by God. The reasons tell. Amos has answered them in these chapters. And as we run through, we'll just try to see how they might relate to us as well. Firstly, God would be unfair to judge them. No, that's not true. He judges other nations too. God is fair. God is just. And God deals with us in justice. Um, I don't know you all, but I'd say this particularly for any who have not accepted God's offer of forgiveness of sins through faith in Christ. God is no respecter of persons. He must, in justice, punish the wrong things that we do. So the second reason for not being judged by God or thinking they shouldn't be judged by God could be that they're God's people. And in a sense, that's true. They are not. They are God's people, but they're not in harmony with God. We saw that at the beginning of chapter 3. <clears throat> their thinking and their ways are totally different. Now, those of us who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ are God's people in this era. But there is no excuse for us. God will deal with us in discipline when it is necessary. There's no respect for a person. Okay, so third reason why they shouldn't be judged. This idea that God is displeased with them and would judge them is all new to them. Perhaps they could use that as an excuse. Well, Amos points out, chapter 3, chapter 4, that that isn't true. They've been warned many times, many times. God himself had warned them by bringing chastisements on them. Prophets of all them. They can't say that they don't know God's displeasure. And if we apply that to us, of course, we can't use ignorance as an excuse to continue and sin. God's word is very clear. Okay, another excuse that we make. Well, they could insist that they perform their religious rituals, they make their sacrifices. We saw that in chapter 5. Amos points out that God hates their religious practices if their hearts are away from him. For us, attending church or assembly meetings will not make any sinfulness that uh, we persist in any better. They might say, well, there's no problem here. We're not worried about it. We're so strong. Our military might will keep us safe. We're not in any danger. And this response is simply, no, disaster will come. Self-satisfaction and failure to rely on the Lord, I think is a danger for us all. We should be aware of this danger. The danger of relying on self, on our own knowledge, on our own skills, rather than trusting the Lord in our day-to-day -day lives. 
Okay, another another comment, another possible reason for not worrying about judgments. The day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, who would put them on top, they would think. And therefore they have no need to worry. Well, the day of the Lord is coming, but the day of the Lord is the day of judgment for them first. The people of the people in Amos's day thought they were safe. Their economic and military might would keep them prosperous and safe, but they had rebelled against God and he would deal with them. Last verse of chapter 6. But behold, I will raise up a nation against you, a house of Israel, says the Lord God of hosts, and they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamar to the valley of the Arabah. The entrance of Haman to the valley of the Arab. But that describes exactly the extent of Jeroboam's kingdom, as told us in 2 Kings chapter 14. So what happened? Well, after Jeroboam II died, his son Zechariah was assassinated, having ruled for just six months. There were five more kings after Zechariah, at least three of whom were assassinated. A new generation of Assyrians came against them, stripped the land of its wealth, and then took them captive. Okay, so that's the end of Amos's direct preaching to the people. So now we come to our third section. Here we have a series of visions in chapters 7, 8, and 9 to help Amos understand what will happen in the future, I think. At the beginning of chapter 7, we have three visions that Amos had. God gave Amos visions of judgment. The first was locusts, the second was fire. And after these first two, we read Amos saying, we'll pick it up at the middle of verse 2, chapter 7, middle of verse 2. O Lord God, forgive, I pray. O that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. And similarly in verses 5 and 6. So one thing we see here is a lovely concern that Amos had for this people. He didn't want this people to suffer. And we can't, we can't dismiss this as selfish, please, because Amos came from Judah. And at this point, anyway, God wasn't threatening these disasters on Judah, but on Israel. It wasn't his kingdom that Amos was pleading for. Amos was pleading for these rebellious people that he was preaching to. And then we come to the third vision, verse 7. Thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on the wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand, and the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. This third vision was different. God was using a plumb line. A plumb line that clearly showed that Israel was out of true. That was clear. And judgment was fallen. them. And Amos understands this and doesn't this time plead for Israel. In the rest of chapter 7, we see how the idolatrous priest of Bethel reacts. He complains to King Jeroboam about Amos and instructs Amos to go back to Judah and preach there. But Amos is not cowed at this. He points out in verse 15. The Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, go, prophesy to my people in Israel. He'd have rather obey God than man. The fourth vision begins, uh, the fourth vision is at the beginning of chapter 8. Thus the Lord God showed me, behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what you see? So I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. 
So we have a basket of some fruit. I thought it was to be ripe fruit. As the Lord says, the end has come upon my people as well. And he gave, and again, he gives reasons in the subsequent verses. Lack of respect for God's law, the dishonesty, the terrible treatment of the poor, and God will bring judgment on them. And interestingly, he also talks about famine, but a different sort of famine. Verse 11, chapter 8. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. They've known the famine of lack of material food, but this is a famine of lack of spiritual food, the lack of a word from God. No more prophets sent by God. They've rejected what God had repeatedly said to them. So now with no repentance, there was no more word from him. And this surely reflects the situation today. Interesting, the people will feel deserted by God. They will feel, they will feel this. They'll feel abandoned, abandoned by God. They rejected God, and at this stage, for the time being, he'll have no more to say to them. They'll want a word from him, but they won't find it. Okay, moving on to chapter 9. So, in the last vision, the fifth vision, the beginning of chapter 9, we see the Lord standing by the altar and ordering destruction. And there's no escape. They cannot flee from God. They can't hide from him. This is another very solemn warning to all who've rejected God's callings and God's appeal to them. God had been incredibly patient with his people. He sent them prophets to warn them. He sent them disasters as threatened. They should have known they were coming. He'd shown grace to them and given them some prosperity at night. But none of this brought them to their knees in repentance and faith. Disaster has come. And they can't hide from God. But the book ends with a ray of hope. Chapter 9, verse 8. <coughs> End of verse 8. Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. Verse 9. For surely I will command and will sift the house of Israel among the nations, which is where the descendants of the ten tribes are now. Undoubtedly, there are a few of the ten tribes, a few people from the ten tribes now living in Israel, but the vast majority of those now in Israel are descended from those who lived in the kingdom of Judah. Uh, Judah, of course, was later taken captive to Babylon, but some returned after 70 years in captivity. But the descendants of the ten tribes haven't been identified, but they will be restored. And the nation will be reunited. And right at the end of the book, Amos describes wonderful prosperity for the restored nation during the millennium. Verse 13 Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treasure of grapes, him that sows seed, the mountains shall trip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land. I have given them, says the Lord your God. A beautiful picture for the descendants of these people. This is the millennium, of course. Now, as we've noticed, <coughs> There do seem to be strong parallels between Israel in Amos' day and Britain today. They and we are privileged peoples who turned away from the gracious and patient God. 
and for Israel, but no repentance and disaster was on its way. And for Britain, rather than there being repentance, there's an increased turning from God. And God will do what's right in his own good time and his own way. Okay, I just want to follow up one or two specific points that we've mentioned. First of all, prepare to meet your God. There was no escape from meeting God. Many claim to be atheists or agnostic. It was noted um, in the news this week, I think, that in last year's census, 37% of the adult British population claim to have no religion. But this makes no difference to God. No one can escape God by not believing in him. Prepare to meet your God, and he must tell us the people. And of course, if we who believe in him are straying from him, then we need of course, to sort ourselves out with him. That scripture, each of us shall give an account of himself to God. The song works myself and to all of us. We learn in chapter 5 that the people of Israel were told to seek the Lord and live. And we repeatedly told that. And the message, of course, is for us in this era too. If you haven't gone to the Lord in faith, in trust, then there's no real life. There's no eternal life. There's no abundant life for now and forever if you haven't sought the Lord. We noted too that religion won't save anyone. The Israelites went through their religious ceremonies, but God wasn't pleased with them because they were not done in faith and with a true heart. They were just ritual. They performed sacrifices because that was what was expected as part of their culture. Rather, their religion disgusted God. Religion won't save anyone today, not even Christian religion. Attendance at meetings is good, of course, but a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus is, of course, what we need. Fourth point, self-confidence is a false confidence. The Israelites were at the peak of their military power. They felt safe, they felt secure, but confidence in self was false. God is infinitely greater than they were, and that we are, of course. If our confidence is in ourselves and our own abilities, then we're living on a false basis. Fifth one, privilege brings responsibility. The Israelites had the privileged position of having been chosen by God, having been chosen by God to know him, to have his laws, to be his earthly people. Their disobedience and lack of faith were flagrant. And we are God's heavenly people. We have the even greater privilege of knowing God's revelation through the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been saved by his blood, we know our sins are forgiven. We have direct access to God. We have the Holy Spirit. Our privileges are amazing and wonderful. Privilege brings responsibility. Responsibility to live to please him. Sixth point, God is patient. God gives time for repentance when it's needed. He's patient. He gives. He gave the Israelites a very long time. But if there is no repentance, there can only be discipline. That's true of the Israelites. It's also true of us. God disciplines them because they are his people. And he disciplines us for our benefits because we're his children. I'll just read those verses from Hebrews 12 that I'm sure we're all familiar with. But the writer of said Hebrews says, Hebrews 12 verse 5, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you rebuke the Lord. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son who he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you with sons. 
Yes, discipline from God is necessary sometimes. Unpleasant, but necessary. Let's remember that if we become aware that someone has fallen and come under the Lord's discipline, as Paul writes in his letters to the Galatians, consider yourselves, lest you also be tempted. Okay, my final point. Amaziah. Amos and Amaziah. Amos would not do what the false priest told him to. Obey God rather than man. We see that when threatened by Amaziah, Amos stood his ground. God had told him to prophesy to Israel, and that's what he would do, even when threatened. The principle was declared by Peter and the other apostles, but they themselves were threatened, is that it's better to obey God than man. Okay. I think I've overrun my time a bit, so apologies for that. But those are some initial thoughts on the book. And if we prayerfully spend time with it, I'm sure there's very much more that we can do. We'll close in prayer. <clears throat>